a blessed Sunday to all. I, I trust that we are all experiencing God's grace and mercies in our lives daily. Now, we've not been able to meet as a whole church since April this year. Now, it's been six long months. I pray that we are all missing the weekly um, interactions we enjoy as a faith community. Now, to help bring back some normalcy, we are now going to have live preaching during the in-person service. Right. So for all of us who are watching this online, it will continue to be pre-recorded. But if you are in service, we will pause the service video and all our internal preachers will share from God's word in person. Now it's our prayer that in-person sermons together with Holy Communion and the meeting of 50 other Hermonites will make the service even more meaningful for all of us. I'm sure by the time we meet again as a whole church and we hope and we pray by Christmas, we would be pleasantly surprised at the growth of some of our young children. Now, for many of us, I'm sure we haven't seen, except to social media, the children born to our members during this pandemic. So speaking of children, both biological and spiritual, now, for all of us, for all of us as parents, grandparents, aunties and uncles, what would be our heartfelt prayer for them? What would be on our lips before God each time we remember our children? Well, I'm sure it would be to grow well, isn't it? That they grow physically, psychologically and most importantly, spiritually. And I'm sure we want in every aspect, balance or all-round growth. I'm sure too, that we will not just pray when they are one month old, but we will constantly remember them in prayer throughout their first year and as they go into their first decade, into when they're 20 years old, even when they're 30 and 40, or 40 years old. We are constantly being the prayer intercessor. To a young church in Colossae, Paul was their prayer intercessor as well. Paul was their spiritual parent in the Lord. He discipled Philemon and Epaphras, who were key leaders in the church in Colossae. And so last week we read from verse 3 of chapter 1, Paul says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Now, as we don't stop praying for our children, whatever age they be, Scripture teaches us that as Christians, we do not stop praying also for our brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter their spiritual maturity. See, we are family we are all traveling along this same journey of life. And we know that we will never be perfect until we meet Jesus face to face. So because the journey is tough, I'm sure, like me, all of us want to be constantly assured that we have the prayer support of our fellow Hermonites. As we look at today's text, we will find that verse 3 to to verse 14 are connected. Now this is because thanksgiving bookends them. Thanksgiving to God begins in verse 3 and in verse 12, it, the idea of thanksgiving is repeated again. Last week, we learned that a maturing disciple is a thankful believer. I submit that thankfulness to God is the motivation for the reason we pray for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we are thankful to God that He speaks clearly to all believers, this would motivate us to pray that through Scripture we will all be filled with the knowledge and understanding of God's will. Because we gain constant assurances knowing our standing before God, this will motivate us to pray that Believers, all of us, 
will always remind ourselves that we have been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of Christ Jesus. Because we are encouraged by the evidence of gospel fruits amongst us, we will be motivated to pray that we will daily walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Church, this means if we are lacking in the motivation to pray for one another, then maybe maybe it is timely for us to re-examine our attitudes towards thanksgiving to God. Let's now go into the details of what it means to be a prayer intercessor. The first point from verse 9 and 10. And verse 9 reads, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, since we have already gone through the two other prison uh, uh, letters, let's recap what Paul says about prayer. Now, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, he says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayer. And Philippians 1, 4, Always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. So we see that Paul is a prayer warrior. Now, though he is in prison, yet he is remembering the various churches in prayer. And according to Philippians, he is at the same time even sharing the gospel with the gods. Paul must truly be thankful to God for all that he has done to have such motivation towards ceaseless prayer. Remember, last week, we saw that Paul's thanksgiving centered around the gospel. So that means the good news of Jesus Christ was his motivation. So the question for us this morning is, is it ours as well? I believe if I were to preach the gospel to myself more regularly, it will motivate me to be a ceaseless prayer intercessor. Now, I've titled this first section, The, the Prayer for Applied Knowledge. So firstly, we see that Paul prays that they be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So what, what does Paul mean by the knowledge of God's will? Now, based on the first eight verses, we see God's will being mentioned already. And if your Bible, could you turn with me to uh, Colossians 1, verse 1? And there we see God's will. What is that? It's that Paul has been appointed an apostle of Christ Jesus. I'm sure we will also all agree that knowledge must be associated with truth, which verse 5 explains the gospel is the word of the truth. And then verse 6 of chapter 1 says, this same gospel is the grace of God in truth. Now, since we have uh, already gone through Ephesians, let's use that and, and refer to that and we kept more details about God's will. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 says, Making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which is set forth in Christ as the plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. So God's will then is to unite everything in Christ and to be filled with God's will. And I would like to quote here, means being deeply affected by the realities you know. End of quote. So, basically the impact of what it means to know Christ in every aspect of our life's journey. Paul then adds that God's will can be known through spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, that's it. It's not something humanly possible, but it is spirit-filled 
understanding. So of the Messiah, Isaiah describes in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So in our Lord Jesus Christ, the spirit of wisdom and understanding is found. Now this means that it is through our relationship with Christ that we will be given spiritual wisdom and understanding. In the light of the challenges the Colossian believers were facing in Colossians 2, now this surely is a very needed prayer for them. Now, in the light that we still face the same challenges today, this is surely also, isn't it, a very needed prayer for one another. Secondly, and here's where the word applied is most relevant. The purpose and the goal of knowing God's will is so that we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, I often repeat this phrase from another pastor. It says, God's word applied changes lives. See, the diligent study of God's word is necessary and good, but it will all go to waste if we do not apply it. So the illustration may I give to all of us, of Joseph and Potiphar's wife is an apt one. In Genesis chapter 39, verse 6, it reads, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and after a time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not, not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph knew as a believer what was God's will. And he obeyed it. He obeyed it even when it might cause him his life for disobedience. Paul does elaborate for us then what it means to walk worthy of the Lord. Firstly, it means it must be pleasing to God. Now, this is important because it means it must not be pleasing to me, isn't it? but it must be pleasing to God, according to God's will. Secondly, bearing fruit in every good work. So there must be visual evidence of tangible effort on our part for the Lord. And so Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 tells us, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So scripture implies it's our duty to seek God for the good works he has prepared for us. And may I submit that not these good works surely will include all the practical applications Colossians 3 and 4 will inform us. Finally, increasing in the knowledge of God. God is so infinitely wiser and His ways higher than any of us. The more we know Him, the more we realize that we know so little of Him. Now, and this, this should encourage us to continue to seek to know God more. Don't you think that God's will is so refreshing? No, just based on what I've already learned, I've come to realize that God's will is always relevant even through my different life 
stages. The truth from God's will can be applied whether in my 20s and or 30s and even now in my 50s. And God in his you know, graciousness continues to reveal himself more and more to me the longer I journey with him. And I'm sure this is your experience as well. Church, let us all be maturing disciples that ceaselessly prays for others to have greater applied knowledge of Christ. We now look at our second section, that is in verse 11. So Paul continues his prayer for the Colossian believers and verse 11 says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Now, power is something we are familiar with, right? Without electrical power, nothing in our home will work. Our fridges will not be cold, our laptops will not be charged, and our lights will not turn on. If you are an athlete, then power is, is needed if you want to hit harder at tennis, jump higher at badminton, and swim faster in the pool. Now, even in the workplace, we seek power too, isn't it? We seek power in the points we are making in our presentation. We seek the power to influence the direction of the team. We may even seek the power of the office position to, to effect long lasting changes. So Paul says, pray too that fellow believers will be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. So what is the difference then? Well, see, in society, power is never equally distributed. It is usually, in a sense, binary. Either one party has it and the other does not. However, in faith, God's power is available for all. All believers have access to it. We see here Paul preempting the issue of chapter 2. The four teachers will always say there is a special set of skills or knowledge needed to receive the power of living well. But Paul says no, the power is available to all already. The false teachers together with our society would also imply that the power to live victoriously is found within us and can be achieved by our own efforts. But scripture teaches no. To live the Christian life is impossible to do with our own efforts. The source of power is external to us. The power is from God above. His glorious might. And since we've journeyed through uh, Ephesians, now let's see what this glorious might is. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe, according to the working of His great might, that He works in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places. God's power raised Jesus from the dead and seated him in the throne in heaven. Now that's a power source like no other. That's a power source that will never fail. That's a power source that will never run dry. That's a power source available for all believers. So may we be ceaseless in praying that we will all experience God's glorious might in our daily lives. Now, I've entitled this second point, Persevering Power. And this is because God's glorious might has a specific goal. Earlier, we saw that, uh, that to be filled with the knowledge of God's will is to result in us walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. Here, in this second point, to be empowered by God's glorious might is to result in us 
having endurance and patience with joy. Now this, this to the world would be an anticlimax. Why? Why would we want power so that we can endure and be patient with joy? That the world doesn't understand. But we understand because for the believer, we desire to walk worthy of the Lord and not to follow the world. And so we are to have endurance to walk in the path of righteousness. Now it is to turn the other cheek when we have been attacked. It's to seek to mend strain relationships in the church as Paul asked the Philippian believers to do. To live pleasing to the Lord is to have patience, isn't it? It means to have forbearance, to be long-suffering of others. Endurance, I submit, right, uh, would be how we relate to our situation. Patience, on the other hand, would relate to responding to the people in our situation. And so Philippians reminds us that we are to have the mind of Christ. So Philippians 2 verse 3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So the mind of Christ means we are forbearing and patient with others because we look into their interest. Now, are Christians to just grit our teeth and soldier on? Are we to say in Malay, we, we just tahan? Is God's power for us just to bear it, to become resigned to the fact and, and to just tolerate the situation or the people? Well, in case we think so, Scripture says we are to endure and be patient with joy. And that is the key attitude we must have. Happiness is based on circumstances and emotions. Joy, well, joy instead is deep-seated delight and gladness that does not depend on circumstances. How might joy look like? Picture this with me. The apostles have been thrown into jail for preaching the gospel. They were then threatened by the Jewish leaders not to speak any more of Christ. And then Luke wrote about them. In Acts chapter 5, verse 41, Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Church, that's endurance and patience with joy. Picture another scene. Now this is Paul and Silas, and they were at Philippi, and they had healed, delivered a demon-possessed girl. Now, but because they did that, they were beaten and thrown into jail. And so, Acts chapter 16, verse 24 reads, Having received his order, he, with the jailer, put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. And verse 25 says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. That church is endurance and patience with joy. Now, I'm sure in Hermon, 
we do also have such encouraging testimonies of endurance and patience with joy. So let's share them. Let's share them in our CGs so that we can continue to encourage one another. Church, let's be maturing disciples who ceaselessly praise that we will all be empowered by the Lord for endurance and patience with joy. We come now to our final section, verse 12 and to verse 13. Now remember, I shared at the beginning that for Paul, thanksgiving is the motivation for intercessory prayer. And so Paul nicely brings us back to thanksgiving in verse 12. So verse 12 reads, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now what we have in these verses is an expansion of the thanksgiving that Paul has touched on in verse 3 to 8. Now these verses tell us what it, what it, what it meant by the gospel, which is the grace of God. So the first thing we want to note here is that there is nothing we can do to earn it. Now, four phrases show us this, that there's nothing we can do to earn it. Has qualified, has delivered, has transferred, and have redemption. Now, these things are being done to us. We have no power to qualify ourselves. We have no way to deliver ourselves. And we surely have no way or no means to redeem ourselves. And that is why Christ Jesus is the good news. We cannot save ourselves, but God did by the death and resurrection of His Son. So remember last week we sang, My heart is filled with thankfulness to Him who bore my pain who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again, who crushed my curse of sinfulness and clothed me in his light and wrote his law of righteousness with power upon my heart. Now, as we think deeper about this idea of qualifying for our inheritance, now we will note subsequently in Colossians chapter 2, verse 18, Paul will tell the believers with regard to the false teachings, let no one disqualify you. Now, so here in, in, in uh, Colossians 1 verse 12, he is giving the confidence to the believers. See, in Christ, there is the sufficiency to qualify. Nothing else is needed. Don't believe the false teachings that there is nothing that you lack. Now, Jews understand inheritance. So in the Old Testament, it was the promised land of Canaan. The significance now is that even the Gentiles qualify to be partakers of this inheritance when they too put their faith in Christ Jesus. So Christ Jesus is the key to qualification, and Christ, Paul says, is sufficient. Of course, the question now then is, is the inheritance earthly or spiritual? In Colossians, Paul gives the short answer. He says, in light, which means then it is spiritual in heaven. Now, if you want a long answer, Right. We can reference Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 to 14. To qualify us pertains to what God has done for each one of us as individuals. Each of us have been qualified in Christ to receive God's inheritance kept for us in heaven. And Ephesians tells us the Holy Spirit that is in us is the guarantee of our inheritance. But remember, 
salvation and our relationship with God is personal but not private. It is not sufficient to say everything is uh, between me and God only. Right? No, because at the same time, Scripture teaches us that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. The picture of God sending Moses to free the Jews from Egyptian slavery is the earthly illustration for the bigger spiritual and cosmic picture of transfer. And this significantly includes Gentiles of every tribe and tongue. So we give thanks individually for being qualified for spiritual inheritance and we give thanks as a group for being placed into a spiritual community. And finally, to make sure we know that all this is made possible only by the cross of Jesus, Paul ends with, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We know for sin to be forgiven, for sinners to be redeemed, there must be the shedding of blood. The cross was where our sinless Saviour died in our place. Church, till we realise afresh that we are sinners, we will not be thankful for our redemption. Let's realise afresh the words of this hymn. It was my sin that helped, held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. When this is our reality, then we will be eternally grateful to Jesus for what he has done, not just in our lives, but also in the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Church, Let's be maturing disciples who ceaselessly praise that we will remember we are redeemed sinners. And may I just add, the outcome of this prayer is realized when we all of us come regularly to commemorate Holy Communion as one family. Let me conclude. Church, we have so much to be thankful for, isn't it? We are so thankful to God that we cannot help but be ceaseless prayer intercessors. Now the theme focus uh, that we are using for Colossians is a maturing disciple. A disciple is one that follows after the master, isn't it? And so may I hold up Jesus as our great mediator and intercessor. And so we see from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at its proper time. And in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Through the cross, Jesus redeems us to be part of God's kingdom. Now Jesus sits at, at God's right hand as our divine intercessor. Church, when we become a maturing disciple who is a prayer intercessor, we are becoming like Christ, our Master. Let's allow Scripture to motivate our hearts to be more like our Master. May God's Word guide our prayer life. And through our intercessions, may God be pleased to build up His body here in Hermann.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you. We thank you for giving us your word. Help us to receive it with gladness and in obedience. May we develop this aspect of being ceaseless prayer intercessors as we grow in spiritual maturity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.